Balcony's first ever year-round bourbon was an inspiration. It all had to work together. A blend of carefully selected ingredients, Texas-sized pot stills, and creative people determined to find the absolute best way to usher a new whiskey along. When you discover how it pairs with a meaningful moment, suddenly the feeling of drinking great whiskey becomes a whole lot more. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Whiskey Neat, Spirited Conversations with Interesting People. I am your host, Christopher Hart. Now I, I you know, I, I'm so excited uh, to sit down for today's episode with our with today's guests. Uh, today on Amazon Prime, uh, the premiere of Reacher airs. Uh, obviously based on Jack Reacher, you guys remember uh, Tom Cruise played him in a couple of movies. Uh, Alan Richson plays Jack Reacher. Uh, I'm sentimentally tied. I- I've watched Alan his entire career. I've been a fan from the very beginning, and I remember the very first thing I ever saw him in was Smallville. So when they reached out to me about doing an interview for Reacher, I was like, absolutely. First of all, we've interviewed other Amazon Prime shows, obviously Anthony Starr. Uh, that show is incredible. Uh, if Amazon Prime wants me to do an interview, uh, the answer is yes. I will absolutely do it, especially when it's someone like Alan Richson. So today I sit down with Alan. We discuss uh, the premiere of Reacher. It, it is incredible. Uh, I got sent screeners beforehand. I watched the entire thing. I absolutely, of course, I'm going to say, of, of course, I'm going to say I like it. However, I want you guys to understand it is John Wick level shot written. I mean, it is incredible. He did a fantastic job. Uh, and for someone who's been following his career his entire life, I'm, I could be happier for the guy. So today I get, I get 45 minutes of his time. We sit down, we talk about the show. Uh, we talk about his life. We talk about drinking. We talk about, of course, we talk about drinking. Uh, and pay attention in this episode, this interview. Uh, Alan gives us a, a hint of something big. So anyways, without further ado, let's pay the bills real quick. So uh, as many of you know, this episode is brought to you by Waterford, Irish single malt whiskey. Uh, if you're familiar with the concept of terroir and wine, you'll appreciate Mark Rainier's Waterford single malt whiskey from Ireland. Mark is combining scotch whiskey and fine wine talents to produce an authentic series of Irish single malt whiskeys. I talk about them every week. Uh, I drank a little bit on the show today. Uh, I absolutely love what Waterford is doing. I love everything they've done. And it is very exciting to to uh, to see where they're going. They have so much potential. the The entire line is basically a bunch of Irish single malt whiskeys that are based on single farm origins, single crops, single locations, different parts of Ireland. I mean, it's it's incredible, uh, and it's unlike the typical industry standard for blending Irish whiskey. It's completely different. So I'm a big fan. I appreciate their support. And uh, without further ado, guys, please uh, give a a round of applause to this week's episode's guest, uh, Alan Richson for Amazon Prime's Reacher. Cheers. Alan, thanks so much for for being on today. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Uh, Listen, uh, I I always tell this to... um, I, I'm very nostalgic as a person, right? Like they, I think they say in marketing that uh, the only thing that sells more than sex is nostalgia. And my, <laughs> the very first show I ever, uh, you know, when you, your formative years, you get into uh, um, uh, watching things and you start to realize uh, what the obsession is in, in television and cinema. Uh, the very first show I got into was in 2002, a little show called Smallville. Oh and, no way! Yeah. Oh, I didn't. I didn't expect you to say that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, my first so gig. I, it was your first gig, right? Like, so yeah. uh, I I uh, started uh, high school the same year that uh, Clark Kent started in the show, right? So it was freshman right. freshman. Uh, we graduated together. It was like the first show that I fell in love with, and you were the first Aquaman that I like on camera, like. And so when I when I think it was Leah who initially reached out to me about this, I was like, yes. I can't wait to talk to him. <laughs> yeah. The first Aquaman you wanted to swim with, man. I get it. I get uh, it. I, dude, I was I was a huge fan. Uh, 
of, of the show. And of course, uh, going back to nostalgia, uh, like they say that fans are, you know, the idea that they're, 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 um, they're fans of you, but I've actually watched your career, like the entire span of your career, just in general, living my life, starting with Smallville. And of course, uh, you know, the DC CW shows and you playing Hank Hall. And, uh, so the, the, op, the never in a million years did I think, okay, I'm actually going to sit down with this guy at some point. And I got to tell you, man, Reacher, I watched it. I watched the whole thing. Let me rephrase that. I, there, I have 10 minutes left in the last episode. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah you left it. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. We like to check out like my wife, uh, at the, the, the climax of the episode. I, I I, I'm right there. I'm right there, yeah. but, uh, it's absolutely incredible. And uh, dude, it's an honor. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. I, well, I appreciate that, man. Yeah. You, I mean, you mentioned Smallville. That was my first gig and I still remember stepping on that set for the first time and there being, you know, 200 crew zipping about and uh, everybody's poking and prodding and just how overwhelming that was. And I think I remember, I remember going home uh, that first day and I just felt like I'd been on my heels the whole day. And I told my wife, I said, I think I get why a lot of actors have like drug problems. Like, I don't know how to come down from that. You know? It was like, it was so much, uh, you know, fast forward to, I don't know, man, it's been six, 16, 17 years, something like that. And, uh, you know, I've start, I started producing several years ago and directing and, you know, now I, I understand that world a lot better, but um, it's funny hearing about Smallville. There is a nostalgia there for me. Um, I, I think about that song too. I feel like we don't have songs like Smallville had that intro song, like friends and Smallville, they have these oh, yeah. songs that when you hear them, it, like, it takes you back. It's a, it's a, you time travel a little bit, but. There used to be an era in which uh, the intro songs were, were actual songs. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and many times they would break, you know, break those artists or break those songs on the show. You know, it's, yeah. Uh, we don't, we don't do that much anymore, but. Well, and I, I think that was, uh, in my opinion, I think that there was uh, a pivotal, a pivotal moment in television, the 2005, era you know sopranos and true blood like this this evolving of television and now we are to a point where the best shows are all those 10 11 12 episode seasons or less right like it's it's there's no right. fluff it's all right. meat i mean this this episode is uh, or this uh, season of reacher i think is seven or eight episodes it's eight, yeah eight episodes yeah yeah that's you know the streamers kind of had, had a lot to do with that you know netflix would tell us, you know, if we were, um, uh, you know, production company coming in to pitch a show or something, we want breadth, not depth. Um, they want a lot of shows with a little bit of episodes, not uh, one show with 26 episodes. That model kind of died with the streamers. Um, and, you know, I, you know, for, for better or worse, I mean, it, it is what it is now. But um, I think one thing it does is it forces us to tell a story in a concise manner that, you know, where you get these great cliffhangers, you know, you get to the point and you're kind of out, you know, and there's no lingering, um, you know, sometimes we do that seasonally, you know, like a show might, might start to lag season three or four and you start to wonder where things are going. But, um, but, you know, really, I mean, I think it's, it's also helped storytelling in a lot of ways, but uh, yeah, you're right. So, and we, and we have, uh, we have an eight episode um, season, which is kind of perfect because, this first season is based on a book and it seems like the right medium to tell that, that story. We, I think we tell the story well, and um, there's no more or less, you know, than what we need. Yeah. Th there's uh, <clears throat> and, and I'm, you know, not to be on a little too on the nose, but it's, it's a little bit like whiskey in the seventies and eighties and nineties. It was drinking with a purpose. You're just, your dad's just drinking to, to decompress from the end of his day. Everything was watered down to 80 proof because if you water it down, you get more money out of it. And it was, it's like that with network television. A lot of that was those 23 seasons, you, right. you, you know, you, you'd end up throwing in a musical episode or a, right. <laughs> right? Right. you've got to fill, you've got to fill the void. So the, the, uh, in this current, we're going through a bit of a bourbon boom right now. Like spirits are exploding, uh, tremendously. Sorry. I keep looking off camera. Uh, we're going through a bit of a, a boom right now. And, um, to the detriment of the industry, they're, they're cutting it down less because it actually tastes better. So you're seeing a lot of cat, like for instance, uh, one of the bottles I sent you, the prideful goat is a cask strength offering. So, uh, it's, it's at the detriment of ad revenue to, to do a right. seven, eight episode, 10 episode season, but it provides an obsessively well-made higher quality product. Right. I right. mean, 
I'm telling you, I, 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 tr- I of course, I'm going to say I loved Reacher. It was fantastic, man. We talked a little bit about Thank it you. off air, but there were moments that you guys didn't have to go the extra mile. And it was so well shot. The, the violence was, I hate to say beautiful. I, I did an interview with William H. Macy and he, <laughs> he, he hates, he hates violence. Uh, right. But right. there was like these super well shot above and beyond effort scenes that you guys could have just been like, boom, 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 shot, shot, shot. Right. Right. But no. Uh, I, honestly, I'm surprised you didn't, I wanted to ask you, did you get injured at all? Uh, yeah, I did, man. I did. Um, you know, off, off for the love of the, the game, but um, yeah, it was brutal, man. I, you know, it was so much so that I actually had a, a shoulder surgery when I got done and I, I had destroyed my AC joint in my shoulder had to have a piece of bone removed um, that had broken off and uh, I tore an oblique. I mean, it was, it was brutal. It was, it was brutal, but um yeah, I don't think, you know, from what I've seen, it doesn't really read on screen, which is kind of what what's important, you know, because uh, Reacher is a bit of a superhero. You know, I don't know if, you, you know, everybody in your audience has read the books, but this is based off Lee Child's Jack Reacher series. That's one of the most popular uh, book franchises ever sold. And, uh, you know, it's Jack Reacher is a beloved character who's, you know, he's a retired military police detective. You can imagine if you're chasing down AWOL soldiers, you've got to be uh, you know, having a unique set of skills and this guy does, but he's, uh, he's left that, that system behind and now just kind of wants to wander. He's a minimalist, carries nothing but a toothbrush and a, and a passport. And, and, you know, he just wants to see what's out there, but trouble seems to find them and he can't help himself, but to solve the mysteries that he, he comes across in whatever town he's in, whether he's in like rural Georgia, where this f- first book and the first season takes place, or whether he ends up in LA or Manhattan or Berlin. Um, he, he sees a problem or gets wrapped up in a problem and he, um, you know, has a propensity to violence and, and to seek justice. And so you get the fun of who this guy is. Um, but, uh, you know, th- but he's a bit, bit of a superhero. I mean, he's, he's almost, you know, not in like a Marvel sense, but he's a little indestructible. I mean, he comes out of these situations relatively unscathed most, most of the times. Um, I think there was one book where he takes like a, a, a some shrapnel and he takes a, a nail to the head and it's like lodged in his skull. And, you know, the next book starts out, he was in a coma for a few weeks and now he's shaking it off. You know, that's about as bad <laughs> as it gets for him. But, but for me personally making this, um, I felt every bit of it. I mean, I, I, you know, um, you know, Reacher is a little mythological in that way, you know, where um, he can, he can walk it off, but dude, I had a, a rough go. <laughs> so, um, you know, and uh, a part of that is, you know, coming off the heels of Tom Cruise, who, you know, was, uh, you made a couple of features, um, you know, he's got a legendary work ethic and his, um, his commitment to stunts is unrivaled. And I, I want to honor that, uh, coming in and, and making this, uh, you know, my own, um, now as a series, um, as much for, you know, his legacy as as, uh, for Reacher himself, you know? So, um, yeah, we went for it, man. Well, I understand that it can be, uh, especially following the footsteps of Tom Cruise, it can be a, a big shoes to fill. Right. <laughs> but um, the, uh, the effort and choreography alone, there were moments where my wife and I were just like, what, can, rewind it. Like, and, and <laughs> let, you know, luckily uh, there's a 10 second rewind. And so there were, there were like three or four fights, action sequences in particular I had to watch two or three times just the process. And I thought, did he do that? How much of that was him versus a, 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 a what do you call him? A stunt double? A stunt double, yeah. And 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 there had to have been, uh, you know, I think of the time that Tom Cruise was, I think the last Mission Impossible, he was jumping across uh, rooftops and broke his ankle and it made it in the end of the final Yes, cut. yes. Uh, was there any moments that uh, made it through the final cut where you were like, I was out of breath? definitely in that, in that moment, or my shoulder was killing me or any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, there was a couple, you know, so I, I, I had a, gr- a great stunt team around me, you know, Buster Reeves, our fight designer and um, uh, you know, our choreographer was um, he, well, our stunt coordinator was uh, you know, he was, he, you'd see his work. He's been in a bunch of stuff, but you know, the Batman for, you know, Christopher Nolan's Batman, you know, he recreated the hand-to-hand combat, you know, for, for film. And uh, so we, we have him on Reacher and uh, he's amazing. Uh, you know, the stunt guys that he brought on are some of the most savage dudes I've ever worked with. There was a prison fight and I think it's the first episode 
where, uh, you know, there was a moment where, you know, I'm like smashing a guy's head into, I mean, it's a very quick fight, but you know, like five on one or something. And I'm smashing a guy's head into a steel sink. And, you know, we've, I've been doing this a long time and I've got really good control. And of course he's like, really go for it, man. Smash my face into the sink. And I was like, well, I'm not, you know, I'll let you do it if you want, you know, but I don't want to be responsible for this. And so I would, you know, I kind of start the motion and this guy would finish it and he'd smash his face into the sink. And we did that fight. I don't know. We, we, we spent eight hours filming that fight and I'm exhausted. They're all exhausted. This guy looks like the elephant man halfway through the day. His face is like cauliflowering out around his eyes. And I'm like, dude, you don't look well, man. Are you sure you're are you okay? He's like, man, no, this is what I get paid for, man. And we kept going, man. He was, it looked like mashed potatoes by the end of the day, but <laughs> you know, that, that was his job. And that's how these stunt guys are, man. I've, I've never quite worked with people as dedicated and committed to it, you know, to the scene that only helps me and the show and the, you know, I mean, it's, it's good for the audience, but it makes me look better because they're so uh, committed. So that helped. Um, uh, yeah, I did. I, I I did my own stunts. There was one stunt the whole season I, I didn't do, and that was jumping off of uh, a, you know a, the roof of a, bu a building onto uh, a concrete, basically. And um, you know, I just in boots. I don't want to risk breaking my legs. So uh, and it wasn't necessary. You, you can't really you're not seeing the face. So right. everything else, you know, everything else we did. And um, and yeah, there was a fight where I I was elbowing a guy in the face as hard as possible. And there's something that people don't know. You know, missing. Is a, takes a lot more energy than like orders of magnitude more energy than connecting with somebody's body or head, right? So when you're when you're selling these, like you're you know hitting somebody as hard as you can, but you're you're pulling back right at the end. You do a lot more, to, you know. You require a lot more from your body. And I tore an oblique elbowing somebody, you know, and 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 it looking like I I was connecting, and uh, they wanted to shut the show down, and. Uh, you know, they're, they're like, we, you know, we can't let this continue for insurance reasons or whatever. And I was like, fuck no, man, you're not shutting the show down because of me. No, I'm not going to be, no. Um, and you know, all the producers come to set and everybody's like, we can't keep going. You know, the doctor said no. And I was like, no, I'm going to stand here and I'm just going to, I'm going to start swinging. So you might want to just turn the camera on. I wasn't going to be the one to like go on hiatus for two, three weeks. Cause we have hundreds of crew and they get paid you know, whether, you know, when they're there and, I, you know, I just, I don't want the show to stop. So yeah, we kept going and we got through it. Um, so when I see that scene, I'm, 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 I'm seeing, uh, you know, I don't know if you can see me hiding the agony of my oblique being torn, throwing these elbows, but it's there. And we've got a couple of those throughout the season, but, um, you know, but, but, you know, at the same time, we don't want people to get lost in whatever I'm going through, you know, I, I want people to get lost in the show. And it sounds like that's, uh, that was your experience. So I'm happy oh, to it, it absolutely was our experience. I mean, the the uh, and you're right that uh, you mentioned the prison scene uh that was yeah. the so so this is what's great about this is how you suck people in right you hit them with uh one of the early action sequences being super well shot very well choreographed with a wide you know not a lot of shaky camera action just like watching mm -hmm. watching it and it's and it's like right off the bat the show has some violence in it that is like I don't even understand what just happened and, 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 and the way it's shot. Uh, I, I don't, the only way I can explain it is you come off as someone who is uh, like Kevlar dense, like lead uh -huh. dense, like the way that you make contact in the show and some of the, the action sequences, it feels like uh, there's even a scene. Uh, and if this is too much, we can, we can cut it, be prepared to mark it. But there's like a scene with a crowbar and I'm just like, why does it feel like this guy is a brick wall like i yeah. feel solid uh and, yeah. and of course it's not just about the violence it's about the, the sh like the visual is it you know the actual visual of the whole thing is so well well done you know yeah yeah thank you yeah and yeah and uh, uh you know a nod to our director you, you mentioned that first uh that first pilot episode with the prison fight Thomas vincent a french auteur he's a, a super artistic director uh came in and, and you know he's not somebody that normally does fight stuff He's a very artistic, uh, kind of almost like a very indie art house director. So to have somebody like that film these, I gave it gave it a really unique flavor, um, you know. So yeah, uh, hats off to our, our directors who did a great job too. But um, yeah, and I think uh, you know there was a lot of training that went into this. You know, I usually walk around in like two o five. You know, I'm six three, six three and a half, two two o five normally, and uh, 
um, yeah, you know, play superheroes. You know, I was on HBO's Titans for uh, several years, and that's like what I do. But um, but Reacher's a whole different kind of animal. You know, um, in the first book, I think he's two twenty, and he sort of gets bigger as the franchise continues. But um, uh, but we decided, you know, we wanted to be a little uh, even more solid. Um, so I was two thirty five when we shot that, and you know, when you're working out that much, yeah, you do you do you harden up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, yeah, you know, so I'm glad that translated. Normally, I would ask this a few more drinks in, but uh, you said you're six three and about two two thirty two thirty five as Jack Reacher, right? Um, so you're you're six three two thirty five, shaped like a superhero. I'm six five, two hundred and forty yeah. pounds, and shaped like a bag of rice. Does that mean it'll cancel <laughs> out? Does that mean I've got a chance against Reacher? Yeah. Do you want a stunt double for me? <laughs> Is that what you're saying? Because I think you could. <laughs> well, if there's a steel sink involved, then yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. Gonna, I'll take the cauliflower <laughs> <Yeah>. face guy. <laughs> yeah. Just a couple extra glasses of uh, bourbon, and uh, I think you could take it. Um, yeah. Medicine. Yeah. Um, I actually saw that you guys filmed this uh, April to July of last year. That's right. That seems That's like right. A, sh- a short amount of time, right? Um, yeah, a great point. Um, I agree with you. That was, uh, not <laughs> enough time to shoot a show. <laughs> um, um, not enough time. I, you know, I don't know why there was like this arbitrary end date, but from the, b- before we started shooting, I was, we shot in Toronto. I was in Toronto already for HBO, um, HBO's Titans. We, we wrapped, they actually shot my stuff out a little, you know, just, they kind of crammed my stuff together so I could get off to do Reacher. Um, uh, so I was in town and I just kind of, you know, I fin- I wrapped on, on Titans and I went over to the offices um, for Reacher and, uh, you know, meeting everybody there. And, uh, you know, one of the producers is like, so uh, are you are you cool with seven days a week? I was like, seven days a week? Working, shooting, filming seven days a week? When does, when do I sleep? I mean, it's like, I don't know if people that aren't in the business really have no idea how much of a toll it takes um, you know, it's, uh, it's a, an exhausting schedule. I mean, people have like, you know, they collapse on six day weeks. And, um, I was like, is that even a like legal, like <laughs> why? And they're like, well, we've got this arbitrary end date. We don't know why, but we have to be done by whatever it was July 31st. But it, it, there are only so many hours in the day. You got to shoot, you got to film the stuff and it takes time to film. Um, so I was like, well, no, I'm not going to work seven days. Well, of course they were like, there's a few Sundays we need you to work. And I'm like, all right, just a few. And then I opened Pandora's box. So like, well, you work those. Like, why don't you just work the rest? Anyway, we, we ended up working. We had two crews working around the clock and I, there's only one reacher. So, you know, it was madness. I mean, I was working, um, you know, I'd finish one day and then I'd continue that day on with a second crew somewhere else. It was brutal, which I think is also why I was, uh, you know, I was like prone to injury because it was just a lot. But uh, yeah, hopefully we get more time if we continue on uh, to film, you know, future seasons but um yeah it was a, it was a tight tight schedule well, i i know like i watched amazon prime uh sorry the boys amazon primes the boys uh the first season it, of course it was great uh the two, the second season was just so well received uh this had the same vibe to me for that there, there's a there's a, not just a level of storytelling uh but there's a level of action that is so satisfying to watch like wow. uh, I, I forget the guy's name um but the snobby rich kid's son that uh, that that looks into you and kind of gives you kind of yeah 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 he, what was his he, I forget his name but uh, I I I I couldn't wait for you to slap somebody right there is a, a right. level of satisfaction that happens uh, throughout the series uh, there will definitely be a second season I'm sure you'll get more time off is my my whole point <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I hope so um, yeah man I, I, I uh, yeah, I hats off to the to the supporting cast too. I mean, you know, they I think they have a lot to do with that. And The Boys is one of my favorite shows on TV. Um, not not saying that because I'm in the Amazon family, but um, you know, it legitimately I think is is just one of the most entertaining um, uh, series that we have. And there's some good TV out there. Um, but uh, you know, the, our supporting cast was incredible. And uh, you mentioned the writing. You know, Nick Santora has been a part of some of the, the best TV in years past. He's our showrunner. So, you know, really he's, he's the, the captain of the ship, you know, and uh, I think he really did a great job adapting these, um, these books to, to film, you know, in, in the books, um, uh, Reacher said nothing is sort of like a famous uh, turn of phrase. And uh, we get inside his head through a narrative device where we sort of hear his thoughts, but it's hard to do that on, 
you know, if we're, if we're adapting this for TV, it's a little harder to do that. Um, and uh, I think it takes a skilled hand to, 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 to subtly get all that information across without it feeling like exposition the entire time. And uh, Nick Santor did a, fa- a fantastic job with that, I think. Well, well um, I, I think, you know, uh, people love to compare the DCEU and Marvel together uh, as the DC being too serious and too dark. Uh, Marvel having a, a lot of humor involved that kind of lends to a success. And there's a ton of humor in this because you start off so uh, stonewalled, like, you know, you're such a, a, a an ominous, mysterious guy. And there is a ton of humor in this. And uh, Malcolm uh, Goodwin was, uh, I, I watched him in uh, iZombie, loved him, thought right. he was fantastic. And, I, and y'all's relationship in this was just so fun to watch like the tons of humor in this so I, I really do think that amazon is doing uh they're doing it right i mean the the level of uh storytelling the 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 directing uh is just incredible the the violence uh, it seems like every show there's a lot of effort put into it and it's you have to nowadays right i mean everyone's competing with netflix but yeah i mean how do you even you know you've got um some of the most iconic film stars ever doing tv today and, you know, you've also got amazing stories that should be told that um, maybe don't have those film stars attached, but their, their stories being told anyway. And I mean, there's you know, hundreds and hundreds of shows. How, how, do you, how do you cut through the noise? And, you know, so, somehow um, Amazon has found a way to, to rise to the top and they do have some of the best shows. Um, uh, so it's, uh, it's flattering to be, uh, you know, a part of what they're building. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy these days trying to, to, you know, to, to find your voice as a, as a new show. And, um, you know, hopefully people enjoy this as much as I've enjoyed the books and many people have enjoyed the books, but um, yeah, thank man. It, it, it feels good to hear you say that you enjoyed that. Um, we, we put a lot into it. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's, like I said, it, it was a complete fun watch. And speaking of uh, Titans and uh, obviously you've, you've spent a lot of time in the DC universe uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask, this is something I asked Anthony Starr as well. Uh, do you have uh, hopes? Uh, is there a specific character? Uh, I had a great conversation with Katie Sackoff and I asked her like, if you could play, because she's, she's played uh, in, you know, DC's flash on CW. Right. Uh, she plays a villain. Uh, but if she had a character that she's always dreamed of being on the big screen, is there, whether it's a superhero or villain outside of what you've currently done, maybe for the big screen, maybe DCEU, maybe uh, Marvel, is there a character you've thought about being? Um, you know, there, there, you know, I always joked about, well, I, it's funny that you, I can't, I can't say right now, but there's, uh-oh. Um, there's always been jokes about whether or not I've, cause I, you know, my first show was Smallville. I played a DC character Aquaman on Smallville, kind of cut, cut my teeth on that show. And when Titans came around, you know, this is uh, a show for those that don't know, um, it's sort of like all the legendary, uh, superheroes for DC, they're, they're sidekicks, you know, or the, the more ancillary characters there. Right. Um, it, so, uh, you know, you've got like Robin and, um, you know, a Beast Boy and some of these other guys. So I played a, a hawk on that show, but I had done the DC thing. And so when they came around for that, I was like, um, I don't think I'm going to do another. And I definitely don't think I'm going to do another CW show. So I don't I think I'm going to pass. And um, and they kept trying. And uh, Jeff Johns, who you know basically runs DC, um, he called me up one day and was like, look, there's nobody else for this, man. And, and, and this guy's like, he's, it's dark and it's gritty. And, you know, he's like F this and F that. And he's a pill pop and alcoholic vigilante. And we just, there's nobody else for this. We've got to do this. And I was like, man, that sounds, wait, what? So where's this going to air again? You know, like it was, and it was DC universe starting up their streamer. And so it was sounding like it was going to be a lot grittier. And I'm, I'm glad I ended up, you know, I ended up taking the show um, because they were right about everything they said. It was a lot of fun. Um, But, you know, there's also a lot of jokes about whether or not not, now I'll sort of have some kind of trifecta with Marvel. And, uh, you know, that, that, that may be, um, you know, we may see something like that in the future. So um, yeah, I love, you know, I love playing these guys and I may get to see my, my dream come true here pretty soon. Um, That that smile. I I know I'm going to end up having to cut this out. (laughs) No, uh, well, okay. So that's, that seems very ominous um, uh, uh, in a good way. Um, I, I am excited if, if uh, yeah, I, a big part of my child, a big part of everyone's childhood, especially nowadays, especially this 
current generation was uh superhero characters right like oh yeah, uh, yeah. superman was the first uh character that i ever uh, obsessed over and then green lantern and then flash and i was more of a dc guy although i really appreciate the marvel films um so yeah i mean this i, I had a great conversation uh, with Cameron Monaghan about him playing the Joker on, on right. uh, you know, on TV. And uh, it was, it's exciting, right? It's exciting, you know, getting to, he said he was the first on-screen Joker since uh, Heath Ledger, which is huge shoes to fill. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so uh, listen, I, I'm all for it. Uh, I've, I'm happy with everything you've done so far in the DC universe. And Thanks, I look forward <laughs> to anything else that might happen. <laughs> yeah. Man, yeah. And superheroes were like, they were kind of, that world is a little bit of like my nom, man, because when I was a kid, you know, my most mom. people collected these comic books and they uh, wanted, there's, there's an escapism, a wish fulfillment to being whatever superhero, you know, you fancy. But uh, I lived down the street from this guy named Nick Chisler, who was, I think in eighth grade, he was like a national weightlifting champion. You know, he was benching like 450 pounds. He's built like a silverback gorilla. And every day after school, this guy, would come knock on my door and I'm like, no, please, Nick, don't make me. He's like, no, I'm going to be the Hulk today. You're going to be Thor. I'm going to crush you. Get in the front yard. And so every day I was in new, I was like, please don't make me be Iron Man today. You know? <laughs> and he would just pound on me uh, and get his like eighth grade testosterone out on, uh, on my front yard. So, um, you know, I, when I, when I think of superheroes, I think about getting my ass kicked in my front lawn when I was uh, like, you know, 12 years old. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's nice that, uh, you know, I finally hit puberty and the tables have turned a little bit, I guess. So we're so, good. Uh, you mentioned <laughs> uh, being young. Can we can we talk a little bit about Maxwell Jenkins? Maxwell Jenkins? Yeah, young Jack Reacher in the show. Yeah. Yeah. Super so, talented. Uh, insanely well cast. Yeah. I remember meeting him uh, before we started filming. They were like, hey, we just want you to you know, you guys just spend some time together and maybe you guys pick up on each other's mannerisms or whatever. And um, I, he's like the most sophisticated, smart, savvy young man I've ever, <laughs> I was like, this guy's, wow. I wish I was half as intelligent and put together as he is at his age. Yeah, the, uh, you know, without giving anything away, he's terrifying. Uh, yeah. On screen, he's terrifying. I've never seen someone who couldn't grow a beard terrify me right yeah <laughs> <laughs> like uh it's it's so uh, i really i i absolutely love what they did with uh your upbringing in the show that the backstory right. as a child it's a uh, it the word retribution comes to mind right like you just feel right. so everything you want one of my biggest frustrations with say typical network television is you don't ever get the satisfaction you want and this the one of the things that um you know, Game of Thrones did was uh, it gave you the the villain you hated for years. You right. Finally, get to see their demise in the most satisfying of ways, and it like it's almost like a, a drug dose, right? Like it's like right, this, oh, right. That, that was great. A little hit of dopamine, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I I, I think uh, I think this is going to go very well. I'm extremely excited for you. Uh, I, I, I you. couldn't be happier. I, truly, truly, truly. Thank you. Yeah. As, as a fan of the books myself, I mean, I'm, um, I don't think there's a bigger fan than me. Um, I, it's uh, happy to hear you say that. I just, I want people to enjoy meeting this character as much as I have. If they've never read the books, I think they'll enjoy the show just as much as those who have, you know? So um, hopefully a lot of people get to enjoy um, what the rest of us already know if we've read the books. You know? So uh, one of the uh, things I was curious about, so uh, was there any hesitancy in taking the role or did you, you knew this was a, this was it. I think the hesitancy was on their part. Um, <laughs> like I, I, I wanted, I mean, who wouldn't want to do this? I mean, this is like one of the most iconic characters of all time. And it's a fair question. I mean, um, there's a lot of pressure involved with being under the microscope of uh, maybe hundreds of millions of people. I mean, this is, I think, I think the, the books have sold over 200 million books at this point. Um, a lot of people are aware of this. This has crossed just about every international border. You're under the microscope for all of those people who have an idea of who Reacher is in their mind. And that's going to be a little different for each of us. Um, you know, I mean, it's hard to ignore that. And it's hard to, you know, to, to, to act like that's not a part of this equation. And then there's also, like I said, I mean, I became 
an enormous fan of Reacher and of Lee Child, especially. Um, you know, a, a hugely gracious and humble guy, but but highly intelligent. And uh, you know, you you want to honor all of the work that he did, and and uh, you know what you're a fan of as well. So it, yeah, there's a lot of pressure to get it right. You know. Um, but there's also, uh, with something of this size, it, uh, you know, we talked about how difficult it is for a show to cut through the noise these days. It really helps make sure that, you know, the stories that you're telling are seen, you know, and that's really what you want. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's hard to, you know, want to pass up on, a, on an opportunity like this because of the fear of what people may think because you can't please everybody, you know, but, um, but it also, you know, something of this size gives a uh, studio like Amazon and Skydance, uh, you know, production company, um, uh, ample opportunity to find whoever they want. And just about every guy that was, you know, even moderately right for this role, um, you know, was was going for it. Yeah, and I think it's safe to say they, they got the right person for the role. Um, you know, to pivot a little bit, you know, before we started filming, you actually mentioned that, uh, that you don't drink anymore, but in a, in a in an interesting way, not for any particular reason. Um, walk me through what you wanted to say. Yeah. So, you know, uh, like I said, I never, never had an issue with it and loved like, you know, I had a wine collection and I loved making these like great spicy margaritas at the end of the day. And it was sort of like our, our, our ritual, like a couple times a week, my wife and I, we'd you know, the kids would, you know, be playing in the backyard or something and we'd make a cocktail and just sit and enjoy. Um, and my wife decides uh, she wanted to do sober October one month. And I was like, all right, cool. Well, I guess I'm not drinking either. <laughs> you know, like, no point <laughs> if you're not drinking. And that turned into like whatever rhymes with sober November. And then, you know, December. And I was like, are we like never going to drink again? Like, what is this becoming? Um, but my wife took it a step further. She enrolled in like this. She started reading these books. She, you know, she started following a couple like accounts on Instagram that were like sober sobriety accounts. And, and I was like, oh, that's that's cool. You know, like trying to expand your horizons into something like this. Um, and then she gets a couple of books that they recommended. And, you know, we had conversations that were really interesting. She was like, you know, the, uh, so, you know, biologically, there's something that happens when you drink, just like when you drink coffee in the morning, you know, you're, you're opposing sort of your natural, uh, your body's uh, production of cortisol, that stress hormone, which make you know, wakes you up when you have caffeine repetitively, you suppress your body's natural ability to secrete cortisol. So you, uh, so you, you know, you lose that ability to sort of wake yourself up and energize yourself in the morning. But the same thing happens with alcohol. And we don't think of it usually like caffeine in the morning. But when you introduce that um, depressant, your body knows that that's coming. And so it actually creates, uh, it actually releases cortisol. So you, you create this sort of state of anxiety and you may not even realize that you're doing that. But when we would hit our like five o'clock, you know, time when we usually had a cocktail, we would start to feel like, oh man, all right, you guys go play take your toys. We're going to de decompress for a second. And really that was the, the preparation our body was making for, for the alcohol, you know, even if it was just a, a cocktail or two. So um, when we cut that out, we started to, you know, um, there, there wasn't that depressant and that imbalance in the evening. So in the morning, there was less of a need to perk up with the caffeine. And I was actually finding that the caffeine, when I hadn't been drinking for, for months and months, would actually kind of make me manic. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've found out I was bipolar a few years ago and it was a shock to me to have, to have a label attached to me in that way. Um, but I had a lot of issues at the time and a doctor, you know, we took some tests and he diagnosed me and he was like, you know, you're bipolar. And I was like, fuck you. <laughs> I was like so <laughs> mad. Fuck you. I'm not man. Fuck you. I'm fine, man. I'm not. And he's like, that see, is. see? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. It, so he's just smiling. Uh -huh. He's probably had this happen a uh, thousand times. Um, but you know, the, the, the caffeine without that depressant, it's kind of aided in an imbalance that was kind of going too far the other direction where it was, you know, sort of I was spinning me out a little bit in that manic state, which can be a, a reckless place for people like me. Um, so I actually quit caffeine as well and just, you know, found this like really great equilibrium where you just wake up and you're energized all day long, and, you know? Um, so she read those books. I learned things like that. And, you know, um, that sort of helped understand from a biological level, like maybe a why. Um, and, 
you know, and then uh, she took a sobriety class and I was like, did you have a problem that I wasn't aware of, you know? And she's like, no, I just, you know, I, I just, I think like we, we've bought into this idea that you have to have hit a rock bottom to decide to be sober. And I think that's a lie that the industry tells you to make you feel like only the worst offenders quit. Otherwise you're healthy if you drink, you know? Sure. And then she said, I think that's a, I think that's a, a lie that we tell ourselves. And um, I don't want to, you know, have to have hit rock bottom to decide maybe it's, maybe I want something different for myself. And, um, it's super and, fascinating. Uh, it was very, yeah, it was, it's, it's such, it's, it's, it's an awakening that I envied in her. And I was like, it never occurred to me to even challenge those ideas. And here she is, you know, striving to just, you know, um, do something that maybe our systems and institutions don't want her to. So it was very, it was really inspiring. And I just happened to be the beneficiary of that. I, I, I stumbled into it and, you know, and, and now I think, um, I think we've benefited in a lot of ways, you know, so yeah many people on the show um you know of course anyone who listens already knows but um i i i own a couple of spirits brands as well as do this show uh-huh. uh as well as uh, uh you know uh, drink professionally quite a bit right uh, so it's such a part of my life that uh, you know i'll take breaks just to make sure because you don't know if it becomes a daily thing you don't even think right about it. right Right. And uh, and and I, I we actually had a couple of doctors in from the Baylor College of Medicine who who discussed what actual alcoholism is. And it's not what we think it is. It's not uh, right. drinking every day isn't even a, a metric for uh, right. alcohol abuse. Right. Uh, actually, what they call now is alcohol use disorder. And uh, he goes, drinking every day is not the problem. Uh, it's if you can't give it up or, you know, and like you said, this this thing where you if it becomes part of your routine, you may not realize that it becomes a need Right. And taking right. the break, like you mentioned, you, you may realize, you know, right. that it became a thing where I, I noticed that I would always get irritable at this point. I need. Right. Know. Right. And so it, it's I didn't expect that level of uh, uh, interesting to come out of your mouth like that was oh, they, yeah. <laughs> like that's really fascinating. I had no idea. And uh, I got into it with my wife, like my wife and I got into the spirits industry together. Uh, that's yeah. how I won her dad over. I found out he likes scotch and I brought no way. scotch over. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, yeah. Uh, and, you know, and then, uh, you know, after we got married, we went to Scotland. So it's a big part of our relationship in the same way that like watching Reacher together was like every night right. we get in bed, right. we watch a show together. Right. And uh, it was awesome to get to watch Reacher together. Uh, right. And it was you know, it's like a part of our routine. Although I'm not giving up television, you're not going to convince me. Otherwise. Yeah, yeah, fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. And I think, you know, I think it's important too to, to you know, make, to distinguish the fact that like, you know, it, we can, you, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. Like, I don't see, like, there's, I, there's no part of me that like takes offense. There's no part of me that feels uncomfortable around it or wants for other people to make the same decision. I mean, I remember some of my, mo- you know, the most enjoyable memorable experiences I've had are, uh, you know, a couple key lime martinis in for me. <laughs> I like to, I liked all the girly drinks, you know, um, on blue mountain state, a show I played Thad castle, this like, um, just notoriously, uh, childlike villainous, uh, linebacker. Um, you know, we, he had this cherry vodka martini on that show. And the reason that became a part of the show was because the, the co-creators of the show, uh, Eric Falker and, um, Romansky, uh, would go out drinking with me at night and I would, I would be like, you know, they're like, can I have a beer? Can I have a champagne? And I'm like, do you think you have any like cherry with a little sour? And, you know, maybe we could do like a martini kind of thing. Like, could you put an umbrella in there? And they're like, who are you? You know? Um, and so they decided to make that this guy that drinks cherry vodka martinis in the morning. And um, that was really much, you know, is it very much a part of my, you know, my journey. Um, and I enjoyed that. So, you know, that said, like, it's, I think, it, you know, um, to each his own. Um, but, uh, but at the, at the same time, I think what I've noticed too, is that people get really uncomfortable around somebody who doesn't, you know, I think, cause they don't know how to react. Is this somebody who had a really big problem? Is this somebody who just, is this just for a day or two? Or are they like, is it sober October? You know, what, it, why are you doing this? And we don't really have, the language to ask, you know, we don't really, we don't feel comfortable yet having these conversations. Um, And so there's this sort of like, maybe I shouldn't hang out with that person or we should not talk about that, you know? And it's not that at all for many people I've noticed. And um, I think 
what I want to do is sort of create a conversation where we feel okay exploring our differences together. I mean, I mean, I think there's a lot to learn. Like I'm fascinated by your show, by your audience, by your company, you know, the companies that you have and, you know, what you guys do here. I think it's a wonderful way to bring people together. I mean, here we are, you know, and this is because of the work that you've put into this, um, you know, but also what is there to learn from your friends that don't, you know, I mean, have they experienced something that's kind of fun to tap into, you know, so I want to destigmatize those who have stepped back, whether that's for a little while um, or, you know, they decided this, I don't want, you know, this isn't serving me anymore, um, whatever that looks like. So um, I think either sides of that coin are great wherever we are on our journeys, you know. The one of, uh, uh, you know, I think the line in the show was, uh, what, what does it say? Uh, Cussing is a sign of a weak mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cursing is a sign of a weak mind and weaker character. Yeah. yeah. So I, I absolutely everything you said, uh, growing up as an adult, when I would meet someone, I grew up very religious. It was a very no, no drinking at all. It's, it's the devil. Uh, right. and, and as I become an adult, when I meet someone who doesn't drink, I assume the same, I assume either, right. either they're religious or they had a problem. They gave it up. And right. I remember the first time, and I'm still close friends with them, uh, to this day, I, it was almost, uh, 11 years ago when I met them. Uh, but friends of mine, Catherine and John Perry, no religious background, uh, no, out, they just don't like coffee and they don't like alcohol. And I remember right. thinking, Oh, you're broken. Like what's, yeah. like, what's, what's, <laughs> right, what's wrong right. with you? Like, they're like, right. you know, we just, it doesn't taste good. And I'm like, and then right. later on, I remember, uh, and this is when I realized who, like I started to get it. Uh, she ordered uh, a BLT. You know, we were all working together and we all placed an order at like, I don't know, Jason's Deli or something. And someone said how good the BLT is. So she ordered BLT and it showed up and she thought that they had forgot to put a patty in it. She's like, this is just bacon and tomatoes. Oh and we're gosh. Like, what do you think the BL a BLT is? Yeah. yeah and she's yeah. like, yeah, burger, lettuce, and tomatoes. I'm like, no, it's bacon. <laughs> it's bacon. Like she had no concept. One of, the, one of the best, most American sandwiches there is. I love <laughs> yeah. it. And she just, I was like, oh, I just, your experience in life is a little bit more narrow and that's okay. And right. uh, I had to change I, the idea of destigmatizing. It's uh, the same conversation I had with Theo, where it's like, he's like, no, I just, didn't realize I hadn't done it in a while. I gave it a break and then didn't go back to it. And it's just, it's fascinating. Yeah. 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 No doubt. And, and part of my, you know, part of my experience was the, the opposite of yours in, in that I used to be a drink pusher. Like for me, you know, I'm a happy drunk. I am. I love everybody. I yeah. have a wonder. Oh, the life is so, and that's generally my disposition anyway. I just think, you know, there's like this childlike wonder, this naivety almost in my looking out of my eyes and I'm like fascinated by everything. So when I drink, I'm like, wow, this is wonderful. Everybody should have this. And so I would, you have to drink. You have to, this is so good. And I, a few times, it took me a couple of times, sadly, to, there was somebody who's like, no, no, I'm good. No, I'm good. No, I'm good. And then somebody else is like, he's good, actually. He's good. You know, he's probably, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's good. And then some, somebody pulled me aside and they go, look, he's a, a recovering alcoholic. He's been sober for a little while and you're making it really hard. And I'm like, <gasps> oh, whoops. You know, and so it, I understand that side of it too, where people are like, I don't know what to say right now. You said you don't, and I don't know why. So let's just act like it's, you know, not, the, the you know, child naivete elevated. is exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so there's that too. So I, I totally understand all sides of this, you know, why we may not want to talk about it and, um, and how somebody just, you know, might have different preferences. So um, it's all good. Well, I, I didn't know this uh, before we sent you a, a care package. So if the time ever comes up for a special occasion, you've got, yeah, you've got, yeah. you've got a few things. Uh, one of the things we sent you that I thought was interesting. A lot of times we'll send birth year bottles to, to guests uh, just because, you know, it's a time cap. So this is the year you were born. The liquid's been yeah. in the glass since, since the day you were born and Incredible. everything you've accomplished, your career, your success is all that glass. Is just in- so like, you know, uh, we opened a bottle of 1969 wild Turkey with Matthew McConaughey, right? Like it was like, yeah. you know, it was a cool moment. So, uh, I sent you something that wasn't a birth year bottle. I sent you a, I believe it was 1966. Uh, it was a I beam. Have it here. Yeah. That's a beam Beam's decanter pen. bottle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, they used to, the, bourbon was made so much and so frequently. Okay. 
Yeah, I'll explain that in a second. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so they uh, they would put them in basically everything, like Beanie Babies. They put them into canters and duck shaped devices, and sometimes uh, bowling pins, just to make them collectible. And oh so, no, kidding! Wow. Yeah. So there's even a, a really famous old crow chess set, which is every chess piece. So the idea was to collect all the chess board, all the chess pieces, and you know, essentially, all of a sudden, you've got 50 bottles of of, of booze in your house. Um, that oh, bottle cool. was from the sixties. Uh, it's a, it's a classic example of Kentucky bourbon and, uh, what you would win if, and when the special occasion ever happens, sure, sure. uh, you crack the bottle, you, there's a little stopper. You just pull the stopper out, put that back on. And then it becomes the pour spout, the little flap you saw. Oh, so, got it. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. It's a pretty special bottle. Um, if there's a, I'm sure, have you guys already done, uh, what, what, what do you call it? Whenever you like have a party to celebrate the launch of the show uh so like a like a rap party yeah have like you guys a, already yeah. done that well no we have uh no we have our premiere coming up and that's usually done like at or around the, the premiere yeah. um so uh so which is early february the, the show launches february 4th so that'll that's a couple weeks away well this this will air on that date so this it's today right now everybody go yes. watch it on amazon yes. prime uh but if you if you have a special event you've got some you know whiskey nerd friends then that bottle is actually a pretty special bottle so uh, enjoy it. Uh, we also thank you very some, much. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Cognac, some rye whiskey, a little bit of everything. And, uh, listen, thank you so much for doing this. It was absolutely fantastic to talk to you. Thank uh, you. if there is a season two, you got to come back. I'd love to, I, I, I can't wait. The show's incredible. And there will be a season two. It was really good. I mean that. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot, man. Really it makes me feel good. We put a lot into it. So, um, uh, I just, you know, want people to love it as much as, uh, as I've loved the franchise. So thank you, man. And I do hope there's a season two. I hope I get to come back and do this again with you. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, thank you so much. We'll let you go. And, uh, yeah, good luck on the fourth. Thanks, man. Take Cheers. Care. Balcony's first ever year round bourbon was an inspiration. It all had to work together. A blend of carefully selected ingredients, Texas-sized pot stills, and creative people determined to find the absolute best way to usher a new whiskey along. When you discover how it pairs with a meaningful moment, suddenly the feeling of drinking great whiskey becomes a whole lot more.